Good morning and welcome to this, the 19th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2017. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones and digital devices are switched off or on flight mode? Um, we have apologies this morning from our colleague David Torrance, and I'm sure we want to send our best wishes to, to him. Our first agenda item this morning is a declaration of interest uh, from the new member of our committee, Jamie Green, MSP. And Jamie, can I invite you to make a declaration of interest? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, my only declaration relevant to the committee is that I'm co-convener of the cross-party group on LGBTI issues. Thanks very much, Jamie, and welcome to committee. We're looking forward to working with you. Um, agenda item two is an agreement from committee to take um, agenda item four in private. Are committee agreed, agreed to that action? Yep. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to our substantive uh, agenda item this morning on prisoner voting. Uh, we are glad to have Patrick Harvey here. Uh, uh, Patrick uh, Harvey, MSP, wrote to the committee in June requesting that we consider the issue of the blanket ban on prisoner voting in Scotland. The committee considered this request and this morning's um, evidence session from Patrick and then from a panel is the result of that. Now, Patrick only has an hour, half an hour with us because he has to be uh, at another committee. So I'm going to go straight into the session this morning with Patrick. And I know that you've got an opening statement for us, uh, Mr Harvey, so if you would like to um, carry on with that. Thanks very much. Good morning, convener and colleagues. Um, can I first of all thank you for uh, allowing the agenda to, to give me a chance to speak to you for a few minutes uh, before I go to my own committee. Uh, and also thank you for showing an interest in this topic. Uh, the reason why uh, I have, uh, I think, something to contribute on this, this issue is that during the scrutiny of the Franchise Bill uh, in relation to the independence referendum a few years back, as, as you'll recall, the franchise was uh, established in a separate piece of legislation to the referendum itself. Both myself and Alison McInnes uh, raised the issue of prisoners voting uh, at that time in relation to the referendum, the franchise for which had been temporarily devolved uh, and doesn't quite trigger the same hard and fast human rights compliance issues as parliamentary franchise. Uh, however, the same principles, the same arguments of principles we both felt uh, deserved to be aired. Uh, and I think the approach that we both took at the time was to give the committee and the government a range of options to consider uh, for making changes to the current blanket ban. The current blanket ban in relation to the parliamentary franchise is not compliant with uh, human rights. And as the, the Scottish Government, and I think most of the Scottish political spectrum, supports the continued existence of the Human Rights Act and compliance standards with human rights legislation, uh, it's, uh, I think, unreasonable to think that we'll uh, simply continue to ignore that fact that we are currently not in compliance uh, or you know, continuing that the franchise as it stands and the, and the blanket ban is not in compliance with the principles of human rights. There's a range of ways that we could go on this, uh, as I think the committee uh, is, is very aware already. We could remove the ban altogether. We could, uh, for example, allow prisoners to vote who are nearing the end of their sentence. I think, for example, one argument is that those prisoners who are preparing for release ought to be faced with issues around what it means to be a, a fully active participant uh, in society. Voting is only one small aspect of that, but it could be an important symbolic aspect. Or, indeed, we could uh, allow judges the discretion. Uh, for me, I think the, the fundamental question is why the prison wall is the appropriate boundary. Uh, people are convicted uh, of uh, offences which used to attract a prison sentence, but which now attract a community sentence. There doesn't seem to be an argument in principle uh, as to why they ought to have lost the right to vote in previous decades, but no longer should lose the right to vote. Uh, and there are some uh, offences which uh, members might feel uh, would attract a, a, a non-custodial sentence but ought to trigger uh, a, a question over the right to vote. If someone had committed uh, a, an offence under electoral law, for example, there might be an argument in principle uh, that one of the consequences would be that they lose the right to vote uh, in a system that they had abused. But they'd be unlikely to, uh, to be seen to pose a threat to society's safety, so they'd be unlikely to attract uh, a significant prison sentence. Uh, I hope that these are some of the issues that the committee will consider. And the last thing I'll say uh, before uh, uh, questions is that I also hope that this isn't seen in isolation. 
Uh, I'm glad that this is being uh, dis uh, discussed by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee rather than in the context merely of electoral administration, because there are other equalities issues which ought to be thought about in relation to the franchise. For example, uh, the future voting rights of EU citizens uh, if this country is ultimately taken from the European Union. Uh, the, the rights of uh, non-EU countries' citizens to vote as well. Uh, I, I think there's a, an argument for taking national identity out of it altogether and simply making residence a requirement in order to vote. Uh, and in relation to disability uh, and to gypsy traveller communities, there are issues around uh, other barriers to participation in voting, which have been looked at before, but which I think uh, still require a bit of a refresh if we're going to be uh, realistically removing those barriers in practical terms to ensure that everyone is able to vote. So I would hope uh, that this issue of prisoners voting is seen in the context of that wider equalities and human rights agenda. Uh, thank, thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Mr Harvey. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of aspects in this that obviously we'll, we'll look at all of that and you've touched on uh, a few of them already and there, there's obviously a, a number of arguments that go along with each of those aspects as well. One of the, the issues that you mentioned in your opening remarks was how, how you, you could practically do some of this um, and we all know what the headline grabbing um, uh, points will, will be in this but to look at it from a practical point of view, have you got any ideas on how you know, practically we could ensure whether it's you know, the end ban completely or it's a restricted group of people at the end of their sentence or on remand or in, in different circumstances? You know, the practical ways that that, that could be um, rolled out in order to give people the right to vote. Well, first of all, I think it's entirely possible to do this within a prison context. Uh, it's not about, uh, you know, a day release to go and vote at the, at the local school. Uh, the, the, it would be the, the job of a, a few minutes, I think, to pick up the phone to any one of the vast majority of European countries which already operate something other than a blanket ban uh, to ask for some, uh, some experiences about the, the practical operation. Um, if, for example, only a uh, a, a particular group within a prison context uh, are able to exercise uh, the right to vote, uh, then it needs to be done in a way uh, that doesn't uh, overly draw a distinction between people. It doesn't uh, allow uh, one person to uh, oversee another's vote or in, uh, potentially intimidate them. So there are some practical issues uh, around that. I suspect there would be, you know, perhaps a, a you know, more anxieties or concerns or stereotypes around this than we would actually find in practice. Uh, it may well be that um, uh, not many prisoners would have a, a huge interest in voting. I, I think that would be a matter of regret. And I, as I say, particularly uh, in the, in the run-up to release, I think prisoners ought to be faced uh, with uh, challenging uh, arguments about what it means to be a member of a society that they're about to return to uh, and, and participation in democracy is part of that, but I, um, I would like to think that it's, uh, it's something that's seen in positive terms, uh, not simply that we are forced to change the law, but that revising the law gives us the opportunity uh, to actually look at a, a, a better balance uh, between the, 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 um, the, 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 the questions of the, the different purposes of punishment uh, mm -hmm. and, and where the de deprivation of the right to vote sits within that. Yeah, there's three, there's, there's three other aspects that I think fall in uh, on, on whether the right to vote is a yes or a no. And there's a moral aspect and there's two sides to that argument. You know, the people will say it's morally wrong for, for a prisoner to get the right to vote and the people will say it's morally right for people to get the right to vote. There's an ethical argument in that, that then, and as much as if we want a free and fair society that believes in redemption and believes in re rehabilitation and there's an ethical argument for it that I'm sure others will find ethical arguments against it as well. But there's also the legal argument and the legal argument I think that has brought it to our attention and to your attention is the Supreme Court ruling and, and where that's put both uh, governments in, in Scotland and uh, at Westminster and in both parliaments for that, that matter as well. Um, and I wonder if you've got any insight on how, how we maybe handle that and, and the areas that we go to look at in order to, to gather the, the, the purest and best evidence? Well, first of all, the, the balance between that moral argument, as you put it, and the, the, the legal argument. I, I can understand the instinctive uh, moral argument that, that some people uh, would express. I think uh, David Cameron uh, put it in, in 
what might also be described as rather headline-grabbing terms when he said he felt physically sick at the idea uh, of prisoners voting. I don't understand why that moral argument can be made in relation to prison, but not in relation to non-custodial sentences. Yeah. If it's the view that someone who has committed a crime, by virtue of having committed a crime and being convicted of it, loses the right to participate in society, loses some of their freedoms uh, that non-offenders take for granted and have a right to access, uh, why is it that we don't deprive uh, all offenders on conviction uh, of the vote until their sentence, including community sentences, have been carried out? Now, some people might say we should. Uh, I think the uh, the, the, the point of a community sentence is to enable somebody to live their life as part of society while still uh, experiencing a, a punishment uh, and uh, giving some recompense to society for the offence that they've committed. Uh, and so I don't feel it's appropriate to remove the, the right to vote from all of those people. But if there's a moral argument, surely it's about committing offences, not about prison walls. Um, as for the, the legal argument, I, I would stress again, as, as the Howard League have uh, uh, reminded the committee uh, in uh, their written submission, that the UK is one of very few countries uh, that are signed up to the Council of Europe uh, which still enforce uh, a blanket ban. Uh, I think they cite Armenia, Bulgaria, Estonia, Russia uh, and the UK. Um, I think uh, the, the opportunity to learn from many of the other European countries uh, which have actually been more successful than the UK in reducing reoffending and in building rehabilitation into the purpose of the criminal justice system, uh, I think the, the opportunity should be taken. Uh, and uh, we're not short of examples uh, around the rest of Europe uh, of, uh, of how that can be done better. OK, thank you, Mr Harvey. Now let's go Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Patrick. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, I, first of all, I mean, echo a lot of what you said. I've been a long-time supporter of the Howard League for Penal Reform. Um, but also, I'd like to thank you for recognising the work of my colleague, the Liberal Democrat, former Liberal Democrat MSP, Alison McInnes, in this regard. I think that we are fellow travellers with you um, on this issue. Um, I think, Convener, you talked about the three issues that underpin this. I, I think there's a fourth one as well, in that uh, prisoners have to endure prison conditions, they have to endure the vagaries of the criminal justice system, they still potentially pay taxes on earnings that are coming in outside. So there is an argument, as with all discussions about franchise, in terms of the right for representation in the government of those conditions. Uh, I have experienced um, the testimony of two particular constituents that I'm working with in HMP Edinburgh who have views on the conditions in which they're held, but also in, in the views around the criminal justice system, which they are progressing through. Um, and it strikes me that this the, the range of options that you present um, are, are very interesting, but, but I, would be, I would struggle personally to see why you wouldn't extend uh, a removal of the ban to all prisoners, because they all, uh, to my opinion, should have the right to um, challenge the government of the day, as it were, or hold their decision makers to account for the conditions in which they're held and for the way in which the money that they're potentially contributing is spent in their incarceration and indeed the criminal justice system. I wonder if you can tell the committee, you talk about that range of options, where you personally land in terms of those considerations that, that we might take forward? Personally, if uh, I thought there was a consensus in favour of removing the, the ban on prisoners voting altogether, I would have no difficulty with that. My suspicion is that that won't be where the, 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 the consensus lies on this issue. Uh, what the Supreme Court ruling requires us to do is to revise the blanket ban. The opportunity that I think that gives us is to talk about the questions of principle. And if somebody in the debate, whether in this parliament or anywhere else, wants to advance an argument of principle why a particular category of prisoners ought not to be able to participate in elections to this parliament or at any other level, then I think uh, I, would, I w would welcome hearing such a principled argument. I, I don't think I've heard one so far uh, other than the simple instinctive, they done wrong, which uh, for me doesn't really cut the mustard. Um, if, if, you know, I, I 
you, you'll, you'll recognise this feeling yourself. I'm a member of one of the smaller parties in this parliament. Very often, uh, I think we're right and everybody else is wrong. Uh, that's not enough either. If this parliament is going to make a change, it has to be one that's going to get majority support uh, across the chamber. Uh, and one, uh, I hope, that the majority of people in Scotland will understand. Um, I suspect that we will end up making a change that's somewhere in between where we are now, a blanket ban, uh, and complete removal of that ban altogether. And I can understand uh, that there are certain categories of offence which people might feel uh, are so serious uh, that uh, a person's uh, uh, right to influence the government of the rest of society uh, ought to be suspended. Uh, the, I think underlying your point, though, was also the argument that people, while they're in prison, are still part of our society. Uh, they still have a right to have their um, governance uh, carried out in a way that respects their human rights uh, and respects their, uh, the, 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 recognises the conditions in which they're living. Uh, and politicians, uh, I don't think any of us would want to uh, get to the point where politicians are, are going around prisons courting votes. Uh, but we should recognise that these are human beings uh, and that the, the conditions in which they live are our responsibility. Uh, and this parliament in, in the past uh, has uh, made serious errors in terms of uh, prison conditions um, and uh, failed on some occasions to respect the human rights of prisoners. Uh, and I think perhaps part of this, this question of the connection between the prisoner's right to vote and the politician's responsibility to take seriously the welfare and conditions of our prisoner state, prison estate, uh, you know, that's another aspect of this argument. Thank you for that. I, I, I mean, I, I would disagree slightly in the sense that I think politicians really should try and engage. If we did extend the franchise to the prison population, then it would be incumbent on us to try and engage with that population to, uh, to take that opportunity to cast their vote and maybe engage in hustings in, in prisons. I think lots of people would like to see us in prison from time to time. But the A few thing, of us have made it there. But, uh, <laughs> the thing I would uh, most like to explore, though, is that idea that um, prisoners might not be given the demographics they come from and voting patterns we see in those demographic uh, graphics on the outside might not be engaged. My experience is that from the prisoners I've worked with in this job and in previous uh, careers, that actually that is the first time that they come cheek by jowl with public policy decision making. And because they have time to consider it, they have to sometimes represent themselves or build cases behind their own liberation that they in fact become far more energized and, and engaged than they would have done on the outside. And it's actually, um, you know, I, I would expect to see a, a surprising number of, of prisoners taking up that opportunity. Final thing, if I may, Convener, is just to explore that point. I, it hadn't really occurred to me before that we hand down all kinds of sentences in this country. Some are community-based, some are um, financially based, and some are incarceration. And it's only that point at which the key is turned in the lock at the moment that you lose your right to vote. Um, we just heard, we all heard the First Minister talking about her programme for government on Tuesday, in which she um, happily took up you know, a long-time Lib Dem policy and I believe one that's shared by the Greens in terms of uh, limiting short-term sentences to no, long, to, to no less than a year, which allows people that much needed rehabilitation time and the focus of, of any interventions we can do in prison to take hold. Um, that will then change the goalposts. So we have people that might have been in prison who wouldn't have had the vote, who now yeah. have the vote. So surely, I mean, perhaps you agree with me, Patrick, that that then completely undermines the whole principle of just removing the votes of prisoners because it's an arbitrary goalpost as to when we use incarceration and when we don't. Certainly, the, the change that's been proposed by the Scottish Government, and, and you're right that I, I, I will welcome that when we see the detail of it, um, is another example of how the use of prison has been changing uh, over the years. Uh, I think it's appropriate that we have prisons and use prisons sparingly for those situations where somebody poses a genuine threat to society and where the work that can be done with them inside a prison is the most effective way uh, of getting their life back on track and, and uh, making them less likely to commit offences in the future. But I, I, I think the, the arbitrary nature, you, you use the word arbitrary, I think that's precisely right, the arbitrary nature of the relationship between an offence 
and the loss of the right to vote uh, is the, uh, an issue that the committee should look at. There, there will be many examples where the same, where two people might have committed exactly the same offence on exactly the same day, perhaps together, uh, and because of different circumstances in their lives, one receive a custodial sentence and another receive a non-custodial sentence. Uh, or they might be sentenced on different days, uh, and um, because of the w when a weekend falls, they, they serve a different amount of time in prison. Uh, one of them uh, might happen to uh, be in prison during the, the course of an election, uh, or before the, the point of registration, to the, the cut-off date for registration for voting in an election, and the other uh, be luckier and, and be able to exercise the vote. So the, the, the deprivation of the right to vote doesn't directly relate to the offence that's been committed or the circumstances in which it was committed. Uh, and so arbitrary uh, nature, the arbitrary nature of this aspect of punishment uh, does seem to me inconsistent. Uh, and again, because we have to change the blanket ban, uh, I think the opportunity should be taken positively to look at the wider issues that this, this question raises. Thank you. Mary Fee. Thank you, and good, good morning. Um, I, I think it's interesting if you look across Europe at, at the way the prison populations are, are treated and the numbers of offenders and, and re-offending and the different models that they have in the way prisoners are treated, whether or not they are allowed to vote and what exceptions there are to that. And, and I think there is a huge amount we can learn if we look at our European partners and the way they treat people that are offenders um, with, with a, an end goal to, to re-offend them and reintegrate them um, back into to society. Um, I would have concerns if we went down a road of allowing judges discretion in whether or not someone would continue to be able to, to vote if they were given a custodial sentence, because I think that opens up, as you've talked about earlier, a whole different range of options. At one end of the country, someone could decide that that person can have the right to vote. At a different end, they could decide, no, no they can't. But another... I, one particular area that we've not covered this morning is the geography of where the person votes, mm -hmm. because quite often people are, are sentenced um, to a, a prison that's out with the area that they live in. A number of prisoners will not be registered to vote anyway. And I wonder if you have any views on where they should actually vote, what part of the country. Should it be um, the prison that they are incarcerated in or should the vote be taken place or given to them for the home address? I, I would be open to the arguments, but my instinct would be that they uh, should be registered to vote uh, in the place where they were resident at the time that they were sentenced rather than in the place where the prison is physically located. Uh, I think there are... Uh, communities that might find it uh, unreasonable uh, that a very large number of people are voting in that constituency that they live in uh, simply because the prison happens to be located there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as well, one of the things that I, I know the Scottish Government is focused on and, I, and that I welcome uh, is the need to maintain contact between prisoners and their family and community. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the most important factors in... in uh, reducing re-offending. If somebody feels that they remain connected to a community uh, and to their family, if they if they have one, um, and so you know, again, voting registration to vote may only be one symbolic aspect of that that wider question. Uh, but I would I would prefer to see it placed in the context of that relationship to to the community to which ultimately they'll return uh, when they leave prison. Uh, and uh, and for that reason, I think my instinct would be. Uh, for registration, uh, either somebody remaining registered to vote where they were resident when they were sentenced or being registered from mm. within prison but registered in the, the constituency that they were resident in. Mm. Just one very brief question that follows on from that. Do you think then there's an opportunity in the way the postal voting system is done to, to use postal votes in prison for, for offenders? I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. Uh, whether whether the, the, the existing postal vote system uh, or a bespoke system mm. that the, the mm -hmm. Scottish Prison Service or others felt that they were better able to manage, uh, I, I, I really don't see that the practical implementation mm. of this is in any way the problem. The problem that this raises is one of uh, the instinctive recoil mm. uh, that David Cameron was expressing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and that some continue to feel. And I understand that some, pe some people feel that instinct to recoil from the idea. Uh, but there is no point of principle, as I was saying earlier, uh, that says the prison wall 
should be the, the, the boundary between participating in voting and not participating in voting, uh, particularly given the way that sentencing policy has changed. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr Harvey. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify something, uh, just uh, listening to the evidence you've given. Um, and I should preface this with the statement that I come to as a very open mind. Uh, it's a new subject to me, and I'm, it's an absolutely fascinating one. So uh, I find this very enlightening, so thank you. Um, is it your argument that the right to vote is linked to the type of offence rather than the method of punishment? That's my first short question. Uh, that wouldn't be my personal view. Uh, I would be open to hearing an argument that said particular types of offences uh, should, by, by virtue of the nature of the offence, uh, result in the, the deprivation of the right to vote. Uh, I as I think I said to, to Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, if, if somebody wants to advocate a point of principle, a, a clear, comprehensive argument as to why a particular category of prisoners should not have the right to vote, I'll listen to it with, a, with as open mind uh, as you're bringing to, to this discussion uh, today. Um, the blanket ban has to end. For me, that requires a debate about whether there is any basis for removing the right to vote from a particular category of prisoners. Uh, you know, I can, I'm, I'm more open uh, personally to the idea uh, that breaching electoral law should suspend someone's right to vote for a period of time than being sentenced to, a, to, to prison should suspend somebody's right to vote. Uh, it, you know, it, participating in a system which a person has themselves abused uh, that seems to me a, a reasonable basis for at least asking the question, should this person still have the right to take part in that system? Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not personally going to advance an argument in favour of depriving the right to vote from any particular category uh, of, of prisoners as, as currently stand. Uh, I'm saying that the, the blanket ban has to end, and if anybody wants to put forward a, an argument for... Uh, continuing a particular type of ban, uh, I'll listen to it. But uh, the, the the current status quo is not uh, is, is not supportable. Okay. And just as a brief follow-up, if I may, um, <clears throat> the, the the example you gave of perhaps um, two people committing the same crime mm. but being sentenced differently in different parts of the country or uh, relative to their circumstance, uh, isn't it the case that by default that one person is given a custodial sentence? And in that situation, the judge has determined that uh, a certain um, parameter of rights should be removed from that person differently to a non custodial sentence. Uh, isn't it the case, therefore, that, that, that a custodial sentence um, <clears throat> attracts uh, a loss of liberty in a different type of ways to somebody who's doing community service, for example? Other than the argument of it's your human right to vote, I'm still sort of waiting on the, the punchline in terms of what other argument is there that people have been given a custodial sentence and by default uh, merit a whole other bunch of rights and liberties to be removed from them, um, deserve the right to vote, other than it's a human right. And, and, and yeah. I'm intrigued to hear the, the, you know, your personal belief as to why people in prison should be given the right to vote. I suppose it comes down to the, the very long-running arguments about what the purpose of punishment uh, is. Uh, and we, we generally separate this out into issues around deterrence, uh, deterring other people from committing a crime, passing a sentence in order to deter other people. I would question whether uh, the loss of the right to vote is a significant deterrent to, to crime. Another purpose of punishment is the protection of the public. Uh, from those who pose a, a serious threat against members of the public. I question whether deprivation of the right to vote uh, protects the public in any way uh, from the commission of, of other crimes. Um, some people say that punishment in itself is a purpose, uh, a, an objective rather than uh, the, the something that's being carried out. Um, I, I, I think purpose is the means, not the end. Uh, those who, who say that punishment is an end in itself uh, I, I would part company whether uh, uh, almost at a philosophical or, or an ideological level. Um, but even to them, I would say, is, is the loss of, of the right to vote a significant punishment uh, to, to 
to, to very many people. Well, perhaps to a, a very active political activist, uh, it might be seen as a significant punishment, but that's a relatively small proportion of the population. Um, no, for, for me, the, 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 the purpose of incarceration and the purpose of sentencing more generally ought to be principally around getting someone to face up to what they've done, to change and challenge their behaviour, uh, and to ensure that they're willing to participate or more likely to participate as a, as a member of society, uh, getting their life back on track uh, and not committing offences in the future. To me, the, the signal that says you're a member of this society uh, and participating in the democratic process is a part of being a member of society. That seems to me to have far more positive to say uh, about the, the, the place of, of prisoners voting than any argument I've yet heard uh, about anything society gains from depriving people of the right to vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A very quick very final quick. question from Gail Ross. Thank and you. We can let you get off to your next committee, Mr Harvey. Thanks, convener. Um, good morning, and thanks for coming along. It is indeed um, a fascinating subject. You may have seen in a specific newspaper this morning that um, there's a bit of hysteria that on polling day prisoners are going to be running all over the country creating social unrest and uh, basically just escaping and not coming back. So to go to the practical aspect that we touched on slightly, um, can you reassure people that this is an absolute nonsense, <laughs> that um, they will not be getting let out, as was said, and what are the practical aspects of actually um, voting within the prisons, is it going to be a mixture of postal proxy and polling stations or would we be better concentrating on one aspect? How do you see it actually happening practically? Well, I, I suspect uh, that you're referring to a newspaper that I rarely read but often enjoy offending, so um, I'll, I'll try and catch up with what they've, uh, what they've written uh, later in the day. Um, I, my... my suggestion would be that the Scottish Government, if it agrees with the argument that some change to the blanket ban is necessary, uh, consults with the, the Scottish Prison Service and, and others uh, about their preference for how this should be administered within the prison context. Uh, I think either a postal vote, uh, it might be that, that proxy voting is, is one way of, of doing it, either a postal vote or some bespoke system for voting inside uh, the, the, the prison context. Uh, is, is easily achievable. I, I think the practical aspects of this really are the, the, the least of our worries. The, 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 the real objection that I think some people raise is that instinctive recoil uh, that I talked about earlier. And I, I simply don't think that's a rational reaction uh, given the way that we've changed sentencing policy in recent years. Uh, and as Alice Cole Hamilton said, like, look likely to continue changing sentencing policy. Thank you. Can we thank you very much for your evidence this morning, Mr Harvey. We're very grateful to you for it and we'll let you go off to your committee, uh, but we will uh, endeavour to keep you updated on the work of this committee, um, given that you brought it to our attention in the first place. So we'll once again, can I thank you for your, your interest as a committee in this issue uh, and just to once again recall that, that earlier comment I made in the opening remarks about seeing this in the context of wider equalities and human rights issues such as national identity, uh, equalities, uh, disability, gypsy traveller communities and so on. I think there's a, a wider discussion to be had about franchise as well. We hear you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. I'm going to suspend committee for five minutes to allow us to change over our panel.
Everybody comfortable? We'll get kicked off again. Okay. Good morning and uh, welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee and we'll continue on with our agenda item on prisoner voting this morning. And as you see, we have changed our set up and we have now have what's called a round table for your interest and information, the, the round table set up is to allow a bit more of a free flow of information, so it's a bit less formal than, than, than the panel. So you'll need to catch my eye if you want in. Um, and hopefully we'll hear uh, some really interesting evidence from you all this morning. And that will be punctuated with some of the members of the committee who will come in and ask some uh, direct questions. And I'm sure they've got them all ready for you. You'll have heard Patrick Harvey's evidence this morning. Um, and we were all, most of you, or all of you were in the room this morning for that. So you, you understand the, the, the genesis of the committee looking at this piece of work. So we're really happy to have you all around the table this morning. Thank you and very gratefully received for your uh, written evidence that, that some of you passed us on. It gave us all lots of reading to do over the past couple of nights, um, but we're very uh, grateful for that. Um, so what I'm going to do is go around the table for you to introduce yourself um, and tell us where you're from, and that will give us a wee insight into who we've got around the table. So I'm Christina McKelvey, and I'm the convener of the committee. My name is Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm the vice convener of the committee. I'm Tom Halpin. I'm from SACRO, who works with the rehabilitation of people in the justice system. Morning, everyone. My name is Michael Clancy. I'm Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland. Good morning. I'm Gail Ross. I'm the MSP for Keithness, Sutherland and Ross. Good morning. I'm Pete Wildman. I'm the Chair of the Electoral Registration Committee of the Assess Association, representing the 15 Electoral Registration Officers in Scotland. I'm David Strang, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland. I'm uh, Fergus McNeill, I'm Professor of uh, Criminology at the University of Glasgow and specialising in questions of punishment and reintegration. I'm Lucy Hunter Blackburn, I'm here on behalf of the Howard League for Scotland. Good morning everyone, I'm Mary Fee, MSP for West Scotland. Good morning, I'm Beverly Smith, ex-offender. Good morning, I'm Jan Anderson. I'm a Shine Mentor working with women offenders. Uh, Jamie Green, MSP. Uh, Chris Hycock, I'm Secretary to the Electoral Management Board who work with the uh, Return Officers and Electoral Registration Officers and administering the elections. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sure, Chris, you'll have realised there's lots of questions on practicalities that we maybe come back to you on <laughs> in, in the session this, this morning. Uh, I was, I was hoping to actually kick off with the Howard League this morning because I know that you have had a, a, a long running campaign on this and much like uh, Patrick Harvey this morning, um, we're, we're interested to know the aspects of why this, why we should, why you know the committee should look at this, where we should look at it, how we should look at it, and the reasons why we should look at it, which is the most important part of it. So, Lucy, I wonder if you wanted to kick off with, with your understanding of that. Thank you very much, convener. I think I'd want to echo a lot of what Patrick Harvey said, and we come at this as a moral ethical case rather than a particular the legal side. And for us, it's about how you conceive the right to vote and how you think of prisoners and how you bring those two things together. So we start from position that the right to vote is a really fundamental right and that if you're going to take it away from people at all, you have to start with very clear reasons for doing that. You have to have really good, sound reasons um, if you're going to do that at all. And we have another side of the coin for us, which is what's the status of prisoners in society? And we still see them as citizens. So we, the blanket ban to us is based on a concept of you know, like civic death for all that prisoners just aren't part of that. And we can't, we can't support that as a view that for us, it's, it's at odds with what we say elsewhere about rehabilitation, about, about prisoners and integration of prisoners. And I think Patrick made all those points very clearly. So that's our starting point, is about how do we think of the right to vote and how do we think about prisoners? And the way we do this at the moment doesn't reflect well on either of those, I would say. Um, we take it away. I think the arbitrariness is, it, of the a current one, current ban can't be overstated. It has very arbitrary effects on people. You, it can have, Patrick mentioned the date of sentencing, how much time you spent on remand, because you're only excluded from voting for the period that you're serving your sentence in prison. So someone who spent, say, eight weeks on remand can only, might only be having three or four weeks when they're actually banned from voting because that's their sentence period because of when their diet falls, their sentencing diet against their remand period. So it's a very much more arbitrary system um, than I think many people appreciate. So that's a, a, particularly when you include short-term prisoners. 
So that's one thing to say. But there is more generally our view about um, our view about whether you can whether you can justify what the basis for which how we've got here. And if you look at the history of where we are, it hasn't been through a, a proper democratic debate about the vote and the prison system. It's been much more arbitrary in its own way, that process. So there wasn't a, van, a ban prior to 1969. Um, and when it was brought in, it was brought in with no parliamentary scrutiny really at all. There was a process behind closed doors in 1969 looking at electoral reform. There was no real debate. It was put into legislation then. And prior to that, there was no ban at all for 20 years. And if you go back further um, into, to, I think it's 1949, it was only the most serious cases who were banned from voting. And indeed, from 1969 to 2000, we banned remand prisoners who were people who had not been convicted of any offence from voting. So the history here is very much less um, coherent, I think, than many supporters of the ban tend to assume. So for us, it's about having now a proper debate um, about where we draw these lines, understanding, I think, the point that Patrick made very clearly, that it has to be a debate, it has to be an inclusive and involved debate. The opportunity is here for us now in Scotland to do that and to come up with a system which is more defensible and, above all, um, more in line with what happens in most other dem democracies in Europe. So that's really where we start from. It's helpful. Okay, th thank you very much. Tom Halpin, I want to come to you next, because obviously part of the discussion earlier was about you know, redemption and rehabilitation and uh, participation as a citizen. Um, and I wonder if you can give us an insight about the work that you do and maybe some of your thoughts on this topic. Uh, thank you, Kabir. Um, from, from the outset, I, I found uh, the, the arguments and discussion promoted by Mr Harvey very encouraging and very fair, and uh, it, it generally captured the, the, the experiences we have as an organisation, SACRO and their partners. We work uh, across a number of organisations in public social partnerships like SHINE, which you'll hear about later, which gives us really extensive experience of working with the, 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 the group that we're talking about. And in terms of uh, allowing them and helping them, supporting them, challenging them, uh, come to terms with what changes they have to make in their lives. And these are real significant changes that, that lead to rehabilitation and reintegration into communities as active citizens. And it takes us back to um, the, the described as the ethical or legal argument and, and the moral arguments within that. And, um, and, and the fundamental question is, who, whose moral compass are we using? Um, the, this uh, defining people into uh, good or bad um, it just doesn't reflect the reality of the situation. Uh, the, the vast majority of people we work with who come in under the, the term of offender uh, quite quickly reappear at different parts of the system as victim. You know, these are citizens, first and foremost. And the stories of working with people, um, as they make those changes, quite frankly, are, are inspirational. And when you get to the root causes of the situations that brought them into offending behaviour for so many, it actually comes back to real vulnerabilities, real issues of deprivation and lack of opportunity that, that are fundamentally what it's about. Uh, I can think of uh, one uh, man who I would describe him as the, the fighting drunk in the, in, the, in the newspaper headline. would probably describe him that as well, as well. And when you get through and work with this individual, you find that he has experienced horrendous stories of bereavement at a young age in his own family that he's never coped with. In actual fact, he's deeply distressed and traumatised by this. And when you start working with him that, he then actually turns into being a leader within his cohort and he has his positive impact in those around him is, is a true inspiration. Now, someone like that, where we are working with, uh, going into really deep issues in their own lives and telling them they're disenfranchised at the same time, um, it, you know, at, at periods of their life, to tell them that, that they have a future as a citizen is, is we can, where in actual fact, if we can work with them, and, and these, it, it might seem a mute point for so many, 
that, you know, do, does anyone really care or whatever? But it actually means an awful lot if you're actually trying to understand what your purpose is in life. Why have you been deprived of all this opportunity? And actually coming to a view that you have a very positive future. I think that captures the essence of it in terms of the, the question of whose moral compass are you using? How did people get to that position? OK, that's a good, good point. Jan, I was going to come to you next and maybe hear from, from Beverly after that um, on Shine and maybe your thoughts and reflections on, on a topic in front of us today. Mm. Um, so I've, I've come to the topic quite fresh, really. It's not something I'd thought about a lot before being invited to participate in the committee, but um, Bev and I got together and look, looked through the papers and we find it absolutely fascinating and we're really, really delighted to be here. Um, so I work with a population of women offenders, as I say, um, and I would echo a lot of what Tom's saying. I would say that I could pretty much say that 100% of the women that I'm working with are women who've experienced poverty, disadvantage, and have a huge amount of um, psychological trauma, abuse in their lives. And in many ways, I would describe them as the walking wounded. They're people who are accruing services, but quite often shut out of services or finding it hard to access services as well. And I guess the word victim is one that I don't really like in a lot of ways, but I feel the population I'm working with are, you know, troubled and traumatised people. Um, and in my experience, I've been doing this for nearly three years, most of them are not voting. Um, but it feels because they feel really a long way away from society and services and, and uh, don't really connect. But we did have had some discussions around um, the difference that the government of the day makes to their lives and particularly um, the kind of issues we're facing with people dealing with universal credit when they're coming out of custody, having to wait six weeks until they get benefit payments and things like that. I can see that people may become more politicised um, because of the things they're facing on their release. In reading through the papers, um, some specific issues, I could see that um, issues to do with identifying the address of where somebody comes from could be a problem because a lot of the women I'm working with are homeless. Um, you know, they've been homeless before going into custody, they're facing homelessness when they come out. Uh, but it would seem that postal voting would be probably preferable to voting from the prison address. Maybe these are two big issues to get into, actually, but I guess we would certainly be interested in discussing things going forwards if, if that was welcome. Um, sorry, I've kind of I've, I've, I've run out on, on my thread there. Yes, I, I guess another issue that came up in the papers was whether there should be um, campaign awareness raising in prison um, and I love the idea of something like hustings. I think it could be really positive work for um, there to be time in prison to engage the women in, in what some of the issues of the day are about, because certainly it would seem to me that it's a positive opportunity for looking at rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, yeah, that's probably enough for now. I think it's a really good segue into what I think we're hoping to hear from Beverly this morning, is, is your experience, Beverly, and, and your thoughts on this. Um, I feel, being in prison myself, um, that there are many people in prison who actually really aren't interested in voting. Um, but there's a, a, a wide variety of people that, that would like to, to vote. Not only that, I feel that depending on sentences, uh, if it's a short sentence, then these people are going to be reintegrated back out into society, so therefore should be allowed to vote. I think people who are on longer sentences, I don't know how many years that would be for other people to decide, but they're not making a contribution to society, so what right do they have to vote? And that comes from an ex-con myself. Um, I think there's definitely... The system of voting is easily manageable from in prison. I've seen the way prison works. They have uh, certain regimes... Um, the, the thing about the address of uh, voting, I think next of kin should be uh, the person, whatever address they're next of kin, I think that's a good idea for uh, that address to be used. Um, I really don't have too much to say at the minute. I haven't had too much time to think about things. Uh, 
I'm better with questions and then answering yeah, rather yeah, than speaking we're, we're off just, like this myself. Just about to go there and hear from some of the other panel members as well, but just catch my eye if you want back in and, okay, and we'll, okay. we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> Alex, do you want to come in at this point? Yes, thank you, Convener. I think um, I was really struck by the point that Tom Halpin made that Jan Anderson uh, took up subsequently, um, which was the fact that um, we often forget about the backgrounds that have led people to offending behaviour um, and the, their reasons for ending up in prison. And, and I'm always struck by the, you know, the horrific statistics of the proportion of people who are in the prison system right now who have been through the care system. These are people who have suffered the failures of public policy, and it is only at the nexus of that journey that they end up having their their right to influence public policy removed from them. Whereas actually, I think that you know, offenders in prison, particularly those who have been through public um, care and other aspects of public support, which has let them down and led in part to their offending behavior, have much to teach us in terms of the reshaping of public policy in this country. I have a specific question um, for those people who have experience of prison, and I'm aware that we've got the, Chief, the Inspector of Prisons here, David Strang. Um, I'd like to bring him as... David's next up to speak. So Excellent. So maybe I can segue into him. Um, struck by... The, there was a, there's a quote I remember from my undergraduate degree. It's probably some you know, great thinker, certainly far more intelligent than me. It might have been Russo or somebody. But he said um, that people are only ever free in a representative democracy in the five minutes when they're in the polling station casting their ballot their ballots and then thereafter they're slave to the whims of the government of the day um, that's a, that's always struck it stuck with me about the importance of voting and you know we are depriving people of liberty in more than one way then if we're incarcerating them and then denying them the right to vote um, I suppose my question is I have worked with many prisoners in my life and they all have strong opinions about their situation Given that they have that voice, that leverage of the democratic process removed from them, what, what measures, what avenues are available to them to um, raise concerns about their situation and uh, make their voice heard right now? What, what avenues are available? Who's that directed to? I think it's an open question, but, but if you're going to bring David in next uh, as Chief Inspector of Prisons, I think he'd be a great start. David. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll leave Professor McNeil to answer the academic question, I think. But um, if I could make uh, three, three uh, brief uh, comments. Um, um, one of them is about the status of people in prison um, and the notion, as has been said a couple of times this morning, that they are um, citizens, they are members of society. And I say that in contrast to, um, I know that in this parliament, when uh, there was a debate in, uh, before the uh, Scottish referendum, as to whether prisoners should be allowed to vote, um, I heard the phrase, when they return to society, then they'd be allowed to vote. And I suppose I would want to make the point that they are part of society, and it's important that we see them as part of the residents of Scotland. They happen to be in prison because of what they've done, and they're being you know, rightly punished by a court. Um, but they don't lose that uh, status as a citizen um, and a member, member of society. Um, secondly, I make the point about preparation for release and rehabilitation. Uh, there's a huge emphasis, um, the Scottish Prison Service, who I don't speak for, but they have a, a slogan about transforming lives, unlocking potential, and, and the emphasis, and I think what we all want is that when someone leaves prison at the end of their sentence, they're less likely to reoffend. they're more likely to be a responsible citizen. And in my mind, part of being a responsible citizen and uh, you know, modern studies classes at school know about this, that you know, voting, uh, taking part in the democratic process is part of what a responsible citizen does. So I uh, firmly support um, uh, Patrick Harvey's um, uh, letter and proposal, uh, particularly for people uh, coming to the end of a long sentence or people on short sentences, that they um, should be allowed uh, uh, to register uh, to vote uh, as part of that preparation. And I think... Um, Finally, just the notion that if this is a punishment, it's a very arbitrary punishment. Um, as I think Jan and Beverly said, maybe not many people in prison uh, would want to vote. I know that a lot uh, of people in prison are not on the register. Um, but some are really keen. I remember, uh, again, going back to 2014 in prison, speaking to uh, some men who were very animated about the referendum and had very strong views, as you would imagine, and, and uh, didn't have a right to vote. 
so in some senses, it's, a, it's an odd punishment in that it only punishes those who would want to vote. If you're someone who's not registered and isn't interested in voting, it's not, there's no punishment for you at all because it doesn't change your life. So we've got this imposition of a, of a secondary punishment as well as the deprivation of liberty, but only on those actually who have an interest in, in voting. Um, and I think to, to answer Alec Coles Hamilton's point about um, what avenues are there for uh, people to raise issues and concerns, I, I, I suppose my counter would be actually putting an X in a box is not an effective way of raising your particular issue. And um, uh, so, I mean, the avenues are speaking to your MSP or, or MP and raising complaints through the complaint system, through the Scottish prison, uh, sorry, the Scottish um, Public Services uh, Ombudsman, um, and raising things with an independent prison monitor. To come back. Just on that, no, I, I absolutely accept that in, you know, even with our proportional representation system in Scotland, there are times when voting is slightly futile, even when you're not in prison. Um, but your second, the corollary to your statement there about it's not a very effective tool of achieving representation is, well, you might, you, the first thing you do is go and speak to, or have your MSP come and see you, which I have done for prisoners in HMP Edinburgh. But if you don't, if you're not satisfied with the outcome of that meeting, or if you don't feel that you're being heard to, or your MSP refuses to come and see you, then you should have the right to change your MSP, or at least try to. And I think that's where you know my argument rests, that I, I'd like to see that piece of the jigsaw included for prisoners. If I could just respond, I 100% I, um, agree with you on that point. All I'm saying is that I've never said to a prisoner when he's complaining about his uh, treatment, well, you know, when you get out, you vote for a different MSP. That's <laughs> <laughs> Professor McNeil, I wonder if you wanted to come in at that, that point and, and, and maybe deal with some of the academic points and some of your own thoughts and reflections. I'll, I'll try. Um, in fact, I brought help on, on the academic points because in preparation, just over the course of the last day, I was looking on my bookshelves, as you do, um, and I found the book on this topic, uh, and, and I've been reading it with great interest over the last uh, 24 hours or so. I, I knew about this work, but hadn't properly engaged with it until the uh, preparing for the hearing. So I will leave this with you as a gift. Um, this is uh, Cormac Behan, who's a, a, a Cormac Behan PhD, who's at the University of Sheffield, and who his PhD was on prisoners' politics and the vote, and it picks up the case of Ireland where legislation was passed in 2007 to enfranchise prisoners, as well as dealing with the moral arguments in a very even-handed way, although he does eventually reveal his own position in favour of enfranchisement, he uh, reviews the position globally in terms of the countries that do and don't uh, permit voting by people in prison. Um, and he looks at the practical arrangements that were brought in in Ireland and that are applied elsewhere. Um, and, and then he does something really interesting, which is he conducts 50 interviews with prisoners about politics and participation and voting in the wake of their enfranchisement in 2007. So the fieldwork followed the change in the Irish legislation. And it's an outstanding piece of work. Um, even just reading the introduction and the conclusion would uh, be uh, tremendously helpful, I think, to members of the committee. And if you proceed with this in some other fashion, this is a person who clearly you would maybe want to consider as a, either a witness or uh, potentially as an advisor if you're going down the, the line of considering an inquiry. So just, just to pick up on, on some of the uh, more academic points, Rousseau was mentioned earlier and he gets a, a reference in the book. Um, Rousseau was, was not a fan of representative democracy, as you said. Uh, he was interested in direct democracy and in fact, some of his ideas around the importance of political participation, uh, political dialogue, uh, political engagement, and, and how that affects the civic health of a polity or a, a community or a society are, are very kind of contemporary in the context of debates about Scotland, um, both in relation to the independence referendum, but uh, also since then. So for me, the, the fundamental problem is, is this. Um, We've heard from the Howard League already that disenfranchisement was conceived of initially as a form of civic death. Um, and Russo was also a, a, a fan of the idea of the social contract. And even before him, back in, in the days of the Greeks and the Romans, the idea was pretty straightforward. If you break the law, you lose the right to make the law. Um, and so a person who steps outside of the social contract, who breaks the norms of the group, 
uh, has to be excluded and shunned from participation in the political process. And originally in ancient societies and through into the Middle Ages, that was permanent. And it was permanent in some contexts to the, to the extent that your civic status was so demeaned by punishment that you no, long, no longer had the right to life. It wasn't that the state executed you, it's that anybody that could kill you if they wanted to with impunity, because you were now a non-citizen. So that was the, the most sort of brutal and extreme form of indis, disenfranchisement. And obviously, as we've moved forward, uh, those extreme forms have diminished, but we have had this oscillation back to political disenfranchisement uh, in the more recent history that we were hearing about from the Howard League. So I've got big problems with the social contract argument philosophically. We could have a long talk about that, but I'll, I'll be really brief if I can about that. We heard some of it before. The, to pick up on, on something that Jan said, if we think of people, many people in the criminal justice system as, in a sense, carrying wounds or being, uh, in her phrase, uh, the walking wounded, I think Jan was speaking about that in, in, a more sort of in, in relation to questions of trauma or personal loss. But civically, these are wounded people. They're already disenfranchised substantively before they're disenfranchised uh, formally by punishment. Uh, they come from communities where their life opportunities are severely restricted, where health inequalities are profound, where levels of political participation are already minimal and deeply troubling. So they're civically wounded, and then we apply to them as part of their punishment or as an accidental consequence of their punishment, civic death, in the form of full and formal disenfranchisement during their punishment. And then, to make matters more absurd, in my view, we insist that they resurrect themselves civically at the moment of their release and, and enter back into society fully prepared to make uh, a, a robust and rounded contribution as a politically and civically engaged citizen, which is completely paradoxical. So the, the, the problem arises from the fact that we're holding on to ancient and medieval sentiments that drive the desire to exclude and trying to have them at the same time as a kind of modern conception of reintegration. Um, and we can't have both, it would, would be my sort of fundamental view. Um, other problems with a social contract, it's arbitrary in, for the reasons that Patrick Harvey um, explained to apply it in the way that we do. If you wanted to look at a group of people who could legitimately be excluded from politics, uh, political participation, my first group to target would be tax avoiders. If you don't pay the tax, why should you have a say over how the tax is dispersed in the collective, put to the collective good? Now that's not an offence, strictly speaking. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a crime which is prosecuted uh, through the criminal courts unless it's full-blown uh, evasion, or that might indeed be a, a matter of civil law. But nonetheless, what we actually have is a society in which people who avoid their tax liabilities have profound influence in political processes, including through the funding of political campaigning. And we take civically wounded people and remove all their rights to participate and regard that as somehow just. So there are absurdities for me in the social contract position more, more broadly. Just to, to finish and, and to move on to what I think the, the, the legal position is, and I'll, I'll um, say that I'm not a legal expert, I'm not a law academic, but all that the European judges were arguing is that it's wrong to have an arbitrary ban. So if we are going to exclude people from political participation as a result of the imposition of a punishment, a punishment of imprisonment, we need to justify it. That's all that they said, justify it. Um, the, the basis of their argument is that the punishment is the deprivation of liberty, and nothing that is not an inevitable consequence of the deprivation of liberty is entailed by the deprivation of liberty. And that's a principle that they apply across a range of issues in respect of the continuing civil rights of, of prisoners. So they said to us, or to the UK government directly, decide. You make law to determine who you want to exclude from the political process or um, you get your judges to disqualify people from voting and make it an explicit and public and transparent part of them being punished. Both of those positions are fine. They're tenable, they can be argued. I personally disagree, but I could, I could live with it if we were prepared to justify it. It's the, it's the fact that we're prepared to do it thoughtlessly, uh, routinely, um, that 
I find uh, particularly problematic, and without any, uh, even any discussion of the question of any link to the offence. So, you know, I, I, my, my view would be that the current position is philosophically inconsistent to the point of being morally wrong and absurd. Uh, and that it's not that we can't exclude people from the process, it's just that we have to, as again was said by the Howard League, be much more careful about deciding if, how, when and who we do that to. You've given us a lot to think about. <laughs> I think everyone round, round the table. Thank you so much. Mary, you wanted to come in at, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of, thank you, Convener, it, it, it almost follows on from the, the, the point that um, has, has just been made. And I'd be interested to hear um, all of the panel's views on, on whether we should be looking at um, a, a ban that is linked to type of crime and, and length of sentence. Because I, I struggle to um, understand how, how you can justify a complete blanket ban and, and removal of, of, of the right to vote. I, I just simply don't understand why we, sh we should do that. And I would be interested in, in, in other panel members' views around um, how we should apply a ban if we're applying any ban. And, and the other um, question I would like to pose is around the, the practicalities of, of allowing prisoners to vote. Because currently, prisoners, some prisoners do vote. Um, and, and I think it would be good to get on the record the process around prisoners that are on remand and how they vote, and the practicalities of how that is managed within, within the prison. Can I bring Michael Clancy in at this point, who can give us a wee background as to how we arrived at the position in law and maybe answer some of the legal questions, and then come to the two members who, of the panel who are uh, interested in the practicalities yeah. and, and bring that together? Would, yeah. that, would that work, Michael? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I, I would not profess to be an expert as to how uh, the uh, Representation of the People Act 1983 came into to being, but uh, I think uh, what we heard uh, earlier uh, this morning from, um, from Lucy and from uh, Professor uh, McNeill uh, is clearly something which uh, it tells us about the, the way in which um, uh, civil disability uh, was imposed uh, as a, an incident of, of judicial decision making. Uh, so, for example, the, the point which Lucy made about civil death um, uh, is quite an interesting one uh, picked up by Fergus, um, uh, is that, that um, uh, courts could determine that people could be civilly dead. Why was that? Because, of course, there was a death sentence in place <laughs> for most of that time. Uh, and uh, I was reflecting on um, how divorce in Scotland uh, was uh, created by the reformers in the post-1560 period uh, because um, uh, you could get divorced uh, on the basis of adultery. Adultery was a crime. The decision of the, the, the criminal court, uh, because it carried a penalty of death, meant that the surviving partner was able to remarry, even if the sentence had never been carried out because the court had determined that the person was subject to a sentence of death and therefore they were civilly dead. Um, and the, the other party was free to marry. Eh? Well, there you are. It just shows you, <laughs> it just shows you what, um, <laughs> it just shows you what uh, imagination um, people can bring to, to the law. And imagination is something which uh, I think is, is uh, something we've got to, to uh, perceive of here, uh, because um, uh, the real issue revolves around the European Convention on Human Rights uh, and uh, um, uh, Protocol 1, uh, Article 3, uh, which uh, effectively says that the high contracting parties um, uh, uh, undertake to hold free elections at reasonable intervals by secret ballot under conditions which will ensure the free expression of the opinion of the people in the choice of the legislature. That's the article uh, on which uh, free elections are based, and that's a reaction to uh, the, uh, the unfree elections uh, which were perpetrated uh, on Europe. Uh, principally under the Nazi regime, uh, uh, but uh, other dictatorships as well, uh, um, uh, and which then, when the European Convention uh, came around, uh, reminding everyone once more that we were, uh, 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 the United Kingdom was a motivating factor in the creation uh, of the European Convention, 
uh, that uh, we, uh, we were able to say that's uh, not the way we expect governments to behave now. Uh, and that, that uh, formulation there is the derivation uh, of, or, or rather the starting point from which um, uh, the uh, issues about um, uh, eligibility to vote uh, stem in the context of uh, the, the number of court cases which have been taken to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, over the last uh, few years. And everyone knows about the case of Hearst, so I won't reiterate that too much, um, uh, but there are key factors which you'd want to, to reflect on, um, uh, which can be found in paragraph 82 uh, of the judgment. Um, and it goes to uh, the issue of the blanket restriction uh, on voting. The provision imposes a blanket restriction, say the judges, on all convicted prisoners uh, in prison. It applies automatically to such prisoners, irrespective of the length of their sentence and irrespective of the nature or gravity of their offence and their individual circumstances. Such a general, automatic and indiscriminate restriction on a vitally important convention right must be seen as falling outside any acceptable margin of appreciation, however wide that margin might be, and as being incompatible with Article 3 of Protocol 1. Why is that important? Because, of course, um, uh, that determines, that gives us the answers to unlock the key of how to make something comply with Article 3, Protocol 1. In other words, don't be indiscriminate, not to be a blanket restriction, don't apply automatically, don't have it irrespective of the length of the sentence, don't have it irrespective of the nature or gravity of the offence. These are the keys which you use to unlock the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the position that we are now in. And the position we are now in is that uh, as, as a matter of general principle, uh, the UK should seek to comply uh, with its international obligations, uh, including those under the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and um, uh, I think that it's quite important that uh, we, do, uh, we, we seek to get to that position because fundamentally this is a rule of law issue. And if it comes to the Scottish Parliament uh, looking at exercising the powers which uh, apply under the Scotland Act 1998 now in terms of elections, uh, then we have to bear in mind certain factors. Section 29 uh, 2D requires uh, the compliance with EC ECHR. <coughs> um, and if uh, a law is made which uh, is not, uh, in, uh, not compatible with ECHR, then it is not law under Section 29. Um, and also, we have to bear in mind that, that uh, these areas of, of the law uh, are uh, protected subject matter uh, areas uh, because the protected subject matter provisions in sections 30 and 31 uh, of, the, uh, of the Scotland Act uh, make it clear uh, that uh, when, we're, uh, when the Parliament would be looking at um, uh, provisions for electors, um, uh, the presiding officer has to identify that um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, if a bill is not passed uh, uh, unless there is a, a, number, of, a number of members voting uh, to the extent of two-thirds of the, the number of MSPs. So um, these are some of the factors that we have to bear in mind uh, and of course the UK uh, uh, government has tried to, to look at this in the past. Uh, the uh, voting eligibility uh, prisoners bill in 2013, uh, which was a draft bill. Um, it, it didn't go very far, uh, but it got at least to the position where options were put before um, uh, parliamentary committees. Um, and uh, it would be, be useful to look at those options again. They seem to focus uh, exclusively on the term of sentence, which uh, might not actually uh, meet uh, the, the unlockability requirements in terms of Hearst, uh, but bearing in mind that um, according to uh, the uh, leaflet issued by the European Court of Human Rights, prisoners' rights to vote, 
Um, I, it's not as good a present as leaving a book, uh, but, um, but I, might, I might leave it anyway. Um, uh, uh, you can read there, it's issued by the court in Strasbourg, uh, and it talks of the seven uh, UK cases uh, and then the six other cases from the rest of Europe. What can I say um, uh, in addition to that, but that we have to think hard about how to make uh, our system comply uh, with uh, the law to which we have agreed in terms of the uh, European Convention. Absolutely fascinating, as usual, and with a bit of history chucked in, as usual, as well. Thank you very much, Thank you, Michael. Uh, always, a, always a joy. Now, if we can get to some of the practicalities, I think it, Pete Wildman, if you, if you want to start, and we can maybe get some insight from Chris as well. You'll have heard some of the aspects of the practicalities of, of this this morning, so, so please enlighten us. OK, maybe if I start quickly with how remand prisoners are dealt with at the moment. If they're on remand for a short period of time, they can simply remain registered at their own address. They're not really absent away long enough to break that resident connection. Alternatively, um, they register by way of a uh, declaration of local connection. That's an annual declaration. And they declare to their previous address, or if they're homeless, they just to address well, or near a place where they sp spend a substantial amount of that time, either during the day or the night. So um, that's how that process works in the moment. Um, we tend to find that um, most declarations come ahead of an election. That tends to be at the point that remand prisoners will opt into the registration process. Um, and uh, the important thing to bear in mind, it goes to the local, re not to the uh, registration officer where the prison is, but the registration officer where the person was previously resident or where they had a connection to. Um, I think that leads me into address and whether you, um, reg where you register and how that shows. If you declare to a local connection, your address doesn't actually appear in the register. You simply appear at the end of the relevant section under a um, uh, the section other electors and just your name appears, your address doesn't appear. Um, I think a point to consider would be if prisoners were registered at um, the prison, then the address of the prison would appear and their name would appear against it if it was done in the same way as a normal residence. Um, and registers for electors have long shelf lives, and I think that's something to perhaps bear in mind. Um, the reference has been made to maybe not removing the blanket ban, but linking it to length of sentence. I think one practical issue for electoral registration officers would be how would they know which prisoners were enfranchised and weren't enfranchised. And again, that's very much a practical issue. It would need just a bit of thought as to how that information would be communicated. Um, I think from electoral registration officers' viewpoints, there are no fundamental barriers. Um, I think care needs to be taken to consult widely with all stakeholders as to how that could actually be delivered to make sure that if any system was brought in, that it was a system that worked and worked as efficiently as possible for both the elector and for the administrators. Um, I think that probably um, sums up our position, um, but obviously happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Chris Highcourt, do you want to give us your insight? Just to follow up what, what Pete said there, I think, and it's clear in both of our written submissions that we're not here to talk about what should be. Uh, we're here to comment on how that would be implemented. And it's for you to determine the, what the should and we'll talk about actually the how. Um, when you look at the mechanics, the logistics of, of running an election, there are issues of who can vote um, and there's issues of how they vote, so that the who's and the how's. Um, the electoral registration office is very much concerned with who is on the electoral roll, who is allowed to vote, and there are a lot of issues there about getting on the roll, maintaining that roll, um, how that is, is com compiled and composed. And then it's into to how that vote is done, how people actually go and cast their vote in, in practice. It's worth remarking that, that policy has changed on both of those over, over time. Who's allowed to vote? It's gone from people own property to just men to women to 16, 17 year olds. So policy does change. And as policy changes and law changes, administrators like ourselves are tasked with, with delivering it, and, and we do. Um, those sort of changes are generally the product of both the, the sort of philosophical debate we have here and consultation. And I think it's, it's essential that there is consultation and there's input on the mechanics of these things. In the, in the medium term, because the, you'll, you'll draw out a lot of practical issues from, from, the, from a variety of sources that, that's, that are broader than the, the people in this room. 
Um, in terms of who, that's one, and also about how people vote. You look at the, the growth of postal voting over recent years, where it's very much now um, postal voting on demand. But associated with that, even the method of postal voting has changed in reaction to widespread electoral fraud. Now, uh, allegedly, so people have had to, to put a signature and a, a date of birth on um, the, their postal votes to, to prevent what was happening in, in certain places. So the, the mechanics do change. In terms of how people vote, um, in the, the written evidence we've put there, we've talked about how people currently vote. So there's, there's postal voting, uh, there's proxy voting, where you nominate a, a trusted individual to vote on your behalf. And there are rules about that, and Pete Wildman might want to, to comment on how a, a, a proxy is appointed and, the, and the, the way in which someone is qualified to be a proxy. And that, that could be something interesting to, to draw out. People can vote in person at a polling place, and I think we've, we've um, talked about some of the issues that might arise around that and the, the, the concerns that might be felt if the polling place is out with the prison. If the polling place is, is within the prison, the issue then is, uh, there, are, there are some issues then about the nature of the franchise. Um, if the franchise was such that people were registered all over the UK, well, you'd have 30, 40, 50 ballot boxes and lots and lots of different ballot papers that people would have to get the right one. Um, postal voting would be would seem like the obvious approach, and it's, I think it's what's done in Ireland at the moment, and um, for those that qualify. Postal voting itself is not without um, difficulty and it's not without cost. At the moment, I think it's about 20% of the electorate are registered to vote by post, and it varies across constituents, um, constituencies. The, the actual mechanics of postal voting could be made to work in, in a prison situation, I'm sure, but there would have to be provision for different um, for some of the elements that exist in postal voting at the moment, the replacement of spoiled or, or lost postal votes. Um, normally, someone can turn up at the return officer's office and say, I've spoiled my ballot paper, can I have another one? Um, and if we get the old ones back and proof of identity, we'll give them new ones. Obviously, that wouldn't work uh, to the same extent. So there, there are certain technical issues we'd have to look at, but the overall notion of, of postal voting could be made to work. It's interesting to read the submission from the Scottish Prison Service on how they apply that at the moment um, for prisoners on remand. We mentioned in, our, in the, the paper we've, we've put there, one of the fundamentals away from, from the, the, the human rights um, paragraph that was mentioned by Professor Clancy there around um, the people having a right to vote in secret. And I think we sometimes sway away from the, the fundamental secrecy of the ballot. And it is interesting to read in the, in the submission from the Scottish Prison Service, talking about how the postal vote is completed um, by prisoners on remand. That is something that is of concern. So there, there are steps taken to ensure that the vote is made in, in secret. Um, it's always something that we, we do want to, to preserve, is that the votes are are private and should be free from influence and free from um, bullying or, or threats from other people around, around how someone's casting a vote. So I suppose in summary, it's for you to determine what should be. We'll do what you tell us, but um, pra practically there are, there are issues to address, but we could tease those out um, through consultation and through work around that. I have to say that's a phrase we don't hear often. <laughs> <laughs> Pete Wildman, do you want to give us a wee uh, uh, update on proxy voting, just, just for the record? Yeah, um, a person is entitled to appoint another um, person to be their proxy. I cast their vote for them, but the other person must be a registered elector and they must be uh, registered within um, Scotland. Um, the other uh, issues that uh, a proxy can only be proxy for two people unless they're a close family member in which the limit does not apply. Um, the rules are that person can apply, anybody can apply for a proxy up to six working days prior to the election. After that date, there's um, strict rules on emergency proxies, and they're limited to occupation, service and employment, or health issues. Um, and it really would be just to make sure, in terms of ordinary proxy, that the prisoner's uh, option, that option was available to them, and that the law allowed them to obtain a proxy vote easily. I, I, can't, I haven't got the law in front of me, but I'm not aware of any barriers to that. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm quite keen to open up because we've heard from everyone this morning and I'm keen to open up if any of our colleagues have got questions or if you've got other things that you would like to add to the, the, the discussions this morning. Lucy. I wonder if um, one thing we've touched on a few times is the role of public opinion in all of this. And I wondered if I could say a word or two about our experience at Howard League of campaigning on this um, around the, the referendum bill, because it was very surprising to us. So, um, so I thought our wonderful quote is that the public is one of the sacred cows of criminal justice, often de deferred to but never consulted, um, Professor Richard Korn. And, and you hear a lot about the public wouldn't stand for change. Um, and we, we campaigned quite in a quite high-profile way in 2013. We, we, we deliberately sought to get press coverage across papers with a range of readerships. Um, and what really struck us was how, low, how, how little the heather went on fire, if you like. There wasn't a sense of great public outrage that this was being raised. I, I think the public is massively um, misunder it's underestimated what the public is capable of the kind of debate they're capable of having around criminal justice this is a common theme of criminal justice um, academia. But it's also, I think, our truth. We, we asked the journalists, did you get many complaints about this piece? No. I gather we spoke to um, Alison McInnes and Patrick Harvey. Did you get an awful lot of um, hostile stuff in your inbox about the amendments? No. Um, public opinion polling, such as there is, suggests about one third of the public already, and in a really hostile press environment generally, already support some lifting of the blanket ban. So I think, I think this is an important point, not to be afraid of raising a debate and also not to make the mistake of not involving the wider public, involving people in this debate, because if you're talking about the vote and, and citizenship, this is, a, this is exactly the moment at which you need to take people with you. So, so I just wanted to, to make that point. Also, just to say, Westminster um, have done big public consultation on the bill that Michael Clancy mentioned. And they got, let me get this right, they got 31 submissions, just 31 across the whole of the UK on this supposedly hot topic, of which three opposed change. So it, it's really worth be feeling K A, that there is a space to have this debate, I think, is the point I wanted to make. Yeah. Any other comments from Tom? Um, uh, just to reiterate the point about uh, public confidence, uh, we, we, we have significant experience in terms of community sentences and supervision of unpaid work, for example. And um, time and time again, uh, the, the initial engagement with the local community um, raises all the questions, the fears that you would expect. But actually, the biggest issue we've got at, at the end of that consultation is, is meeting the increased expectations and the demands for, a, for, for, for assistance from people who are doing that type of work. So the, an informed public is very, very engaged. The only other, the other point around um, is, the, is the divide in the type of offence uh, uh, rather than the, the length of a sentence or whatever. I just want to talk about the type of offence. And you, you know, the, the, the reality is that um, a, 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 it's a very blunt, uh, tool to use uh, uh, the actual crime as a title. You know, uh, the tragedy involved in many homicides on both sides impact, and, and you know, a woman who spent a life of being abused who ends up in a very tragic circumstance in, in the court. You know, but so you could say that taking someone's life is the most heinous crime and is at the top of the tree, but in those circumstances, would you apply it there? And, you know, and that could go through into um, uh, crimes of acquisition, there's real poverty, etc. So I, I, I just really throw up an alarm bell around using the type of crime as the, as the arbiter. Okay, well, thank you very much. Alex. Thank you, Convener. Uh, my remarks come very sort of handsomely on the tail of what Tom just said there. It's a great segue into the this sort of uh, discussion I've been having in my head. I I'm tend to do that quite a bit. But um, this session has been incredibly helpful for me in terms of cementing my own view um, that actually, I, as I personally see it, we should lift the blanket ban it's in, in its entirety. And I come down to a couple of things that have been said. Firstly, around the notion of civic death. It's a bit like that old joke, you can't be half pregnant, you can't be half dead. Either we say that custodial sentence leads to civic death or it doesn't. It, it's a binary equation for me. And I think that um, Professor Fergus um, point, made a, a really elegant remark, um, which I think is yours, but it, you might have been reading it, that nothing that is not inevitable as a result of the deprivation of liberty should be included in punishment. And actually, for me, that, in, that sums up our approach to custody 
in this country, and that the removal of the franchise is actually just a, a, an arbitrary byproduct of that. It may not actually happen. You can serve, you could serve a three-year prison sentence and never lose your right to vote, given on the timing of electoral cycles. So it, it does strike me as arbitrary. As such, I do not believe that even if it's an incremental approach to lifting the ban, that doing so for length of sentence or severity of sentence or severity of crime would be an appropriate way to do it because of the inconsistency of the application of sentencing by the Scottish courts and indeed the, uh, the nature of offences that, that might come up and the, the interpretation of the law around that. So for that reason, Kamina, um, I'm completely convinced. More a declaration than a yeah. question, Mr Cole Hamilton. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Green. Um, okay, so I'm trying to take stock of the various views around the table. I think given that there seems to be consensus that no one's particularly uh, against the concept of changing the status quo, it strikes me that there are, there's really a spectrum here. And at one end of the spectrum is the status quo where there's a blanket ban. At the other end of the spectrum, there's a complete reversal of the ban. And by default, everyone and anyone who's eligible to vote can vote. And then there seems to be a lot of places in the middle. And uh, I guess some of the factors that are jumping out of me is that this is a very three-dimensional thing, uh, where, where, you know, in terms of who can or can't vote. And some of the parameters, for example, type of offence have been mooted. Other things that strike me are whether uh, the sentence is custodial or non-custodial, which seems to be the status quo. Uh, there's a little bit of discussion around length of sentences, whether they're short or long. Uh, which I think you, you touched on. But I think even falling on from that is the other dimension of where the person sits within the cycle of their sentence relative to the electoral cycle itself. Uh, and what I mean by that is the example given that if someone is in a long sentence by which the term of the election that they're eligible to vote in or may vote in is not relevant to them because they will still be in custodial sentence by the end of that electoral cycle, does that have any effect on their ability to vote or by default their interest in voting at all? Um, so the, there seems to be a lot of unpicking to be done and, and I'm quite keen to hear more views on, on the parameters that we use. Do we just go from one end of the spectrum to the other or do we try and find somewhere in the middle that meets the criteria of some of these quite complex dimensions? And I think even added on to that is maybe a fourth dimension which is the arbitrary application of it. Is it, a, uh, uh, is it mandatory primary legislation that takes the rules? Do judges have an element of, uh, of, of uh, arbitrary decision making in this? If, if, for example, you're going down the route of offence-led rather than uh, sentence-led. Um, so I think it's, it's clearly very complex, but I'm very keen to explore perhaps what kicked this off. This thought process was what you said, Beverly, on, around people who are in long sentences, whether they should have the right uh, to vote and whether it even affects them if they are not leaving prison during the cycle of that electoral term anyway. So really keen to hear more thoughts and ideas around that. Beverly, have you, have you, do you want to come in? Have you got anything to say? <clears throat> I think I already said. I just I think that people who are serving longer sentences, they they're not contributing to society. Um, they are now of immediate effect of uh, any changes of any elections. Uh, that's really it. Okay. Okay. Professor. On on that point, there's there's a kind of. Uh, a paradox in the social contract position, you know, that if you if you break the rules, you can't make the rules, uh, which relates to this question of if a person is in custody for the full term of a government, then should they have a say over the composition of that government through the uh, parliamentary election? And actually, one of the conundrums for the people who support the social contract position is what that means then is that that prisoner has no say in the laws that are formed to which they will subsequently be subject. And since they didn't play any part in the political process that created the laws by which they are bound, should they be bound by those laws? There's, there's a, there's a, I mean, philosophers genuinely regard that as a, as a, as a significant problem and, and even a contradiction in the social contractarian. Yeah. 
Well, you, you, you could, and, and that, would, that indeed is, is why uh, people like Rousseau and others argue that it's not just a question of electing an, a, a representative body, it's a question of real political participation that underlines consent to being governed. And in the absence of consent, all the state's doing is exercising power illegitimately on people who, who don't opt into that. So there's a, there are big, big questions at stake, but on a more, um, a more practical point, um, just to, to pick up on, on what Tom is saying, I, I'm slightly um, torn on the question of judicial discretion over disqualification. Um, just to make it clear though, what I think the European judges are arguing for is that the punishment must fit the crime. And that's not a question of severity of the crime, it's a question of the nature of the crime. So disenfranchisement is a political punishment. So the crime to which it should be applied should be a political crime. So misconduct in a public office, a political office, uh, offences against uh, acts that seek to govern the proper conduct of elections, those would be the sorts of things that might feasibly, logically lead to uh, disenfranchisement as a punishment. The, fact, the mere fact that the crime is serious or serious enough to warrant a long prison sentence doesn't create a logic for disenfranchisement according to the the view of the, the European judges, if I've understood their position correctly. And as I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm probably straying into territory I shouldn't, but uh, that's my understanding. David. Thanks for that. I wanted to comment on, on the two previous contributions, which seem to suggest that um, the law would only affect people after they've left prison, but it absolutely affects them while they're in prison. So changes to early automatic release for long sentences, for instance. Um, and another example, um, the Scottish Prison Service have announced that by the end of next year, every prison in Scotland will be smoke-free, which they're not at the moment. And that's as a direct consequence of decisions made in this, in this building. So laws passed by um, politicians locally and nationally do have an impact on people's lives while they're in prison as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Tom? Yeah. Uh, just uh, to return to the point about someone serving, serving a sentence in which they will not be liberated during the time of that parliament, but the interest of them, there's, the, the, there's the interest that that person has in terms of their own uh, disenfranchisement. But, you know, there's a huge... In, 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 if, uh, uh, fellow organisation families outside were here, they would be making the point about families affected by imprisonment, which immediately opens up those real interests that people have for what's happening uh, and impacts on them around it. And one of the, if, if you go and look at what actually aids um, desistance and uh, reducing reoffending, and we've had, we've had the Scottish Government uh, research into what works in the academic research and when, what we do know is that that uh, relationship with family is hugely important to someone having a positive future so I, I just want to make that point around someone who's not outside in the community still has a reason to be enfranchised. Thank, thanks very much Tom. I was very struck with uh, Professor McNeill's understanding of what the law requires of us, Michael, and I'm wondering whether you can confirm that. <laughs> no, I think, I think that that's uh, exactly right, that um, um, uh, you get uh, case, uh, cases in Italy, for example, where uh, it's been electoral fraud that people have been involved in, and uh, that results in disenfranchisement. Um, uh, there may then uh, be a case for uh, entering into some kind of discussion with the sentencing council as to whether this would be the sort of thing. But, of course, at the moment, um, uh, it doesn't come up like that. It's not an add-on. Uh, it's not an option. Um, it is a consequence. Um, uh, and so, therefore, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Parliament and uh, the government uh, have to make up their minds as to which route they want to follow. Um, and then you can figure out the other uh, consequential changes which will be necessary. Thank you very much. Professor McNeill. For me, uh, criminologists um, refer to that phenomenon as the collateral consequences of punishment. I think you used the term incidental, so not an intended um, 
not necessarily an intended and deliberate part of the punishment that's imposed, but just something that happens as a result of it. And people like me who study processes of desistance, so how, how and why people stop offending and actually achieve uh, successful reintegration, are very concerned with collateral consequences because there's uh, overwhelming evidence internationally that the collateral consequences of uh, punishments that we, the punishments that we intend, so the unintended aspects of the penalties that we impose, uh, produce profound barriers to the outcome that we wish the punishment to secure, which is ultimately the successful reintegration of the person as a law-abiding member of society. I thought I would just maybe read in a. A, s a single short quote from a, a serving prisoner in Ireland who was interviewed by Cormac and, it, and he opens his whole book with this comment which I, gets to the nub of the issue in a sense in terms of the impact on people of political participation, people in prison. This comes from Gavin who was serving life when he was uh, interviewed and he says, voting allows the prisoner to feel part of a wider community, something incarceration takes away. It also allows the prisoner to vote for and against changes which, which may affect his or her time in custody and on release. I hope that our vote is not a wasted one. If we're valued enough to be asked to vote, then I hope our wants, needs and requests are listened to. Being in custody takes away a large part of a person's feeling of self-worth. Being allowed to vote gives back some of that lost feeling. This in turn will make better citizens, he hoped. And I think most criminologists would probably argue that uh, enfranchisement is important symbolically, just as expressed by Gavin there, but it's, it's only the beginning. You know, if, if we really want to support desistance from crime and reintegration, then much more um, practical efforts to create more substantial forms of enfranchisement, engagement and participation are required. That is the thrust of Scottish penal policy at the moment, so it's a kind of... Uh, uh, it's, it's inconsistent. Uh, the, the position in relation to voting is inconsistent with the general thrust of our policy just now. Yeah, David. Uh, just add an example of collateral impact of a prison sentence, and it is um, in relation to people trying to get employment after they've left prison. So the sentence was a prison sentence, so they've lost their liberty for four years or six years or whatever. And then the, we talk about the debt being paid to society, but actually the cost of that, the, the impact continues because it, it is much more difficult to get employment if you've got a criminal conviction and a, and a prison sentence behind you. Um, and so that's just, a, just another example. No one designed it that way, but that's a consequence uh, in terms of... Uh, and and it, it absolutely acts against uh, all the best practice of rehabilitation and reintegration. If someone can't get a job, um, that then it kind of completely goes against it. So it's not just an unfortunate consequence, but it's a very damaging consequence. So we're sort of bumping up to the end of our time this morning, but Michael, do you want to come in? Uh, uh, Committee Long, um, I think that some of the discussion which we've had uh, uh, in the last few minutes has emphasised exactly how important the right to vote is. Mm -hmm. And there is a danger sometimes that we might uh, forget what a struggle it was for people to obtain the right to vote, um, a, a struggle which um, uh, people in this room will know people who participated in that struggle. Uh, so I think that that's quite important for us to reflect on and that uh, we as citizens, not residents, but citizens, uh, have uh, that right to vote as determined by law uh, and uh, that, that, uh, that that participation in uh, the democratic project is something that we've got to remember that when we talk about having the right to vote, uh, everyone has the right to vote. And the act of disenfranchisement is an action of the state to remove that right. And we shouldn't forget exactly what the relationship is all about there. So I hope you'd agree with me that's a good place to finish our evidence this morning and give our grateful thanks from myself and the committee members for all of your evidence this morning. You've given us some very clear routes that we have to pursue. Uh, which we will talk about after uh, we go into private session this morning. But very uh, um, grateful for your assistance in, in this inquiry this morning. And if you go away and you think, I should have said this, or I should have asked that, or I should have made that, please get back, back in touch with the, the clerks. As you see, this will be an issue that will be ongoing for a while in committee, because uh, we have to come up with some resolution. 
So thank you so much uh, for your participation. And I'm going to suspend committee now to go into private.